more content creators that keep getting onto Siege, that's better for the game overall, the health of the game. And eventually, as I said before, that will translate to, to the esports program with time, probably not right away. All right, let's get started. It's episode six from Jake and Guz for The Siege Show. And we're doing this one live, apparently. We've got a little audience. Do we want to get- Crowd claps now. A little clap. <laughs> yeah, woo! Yeah. If you too wish to be part of the live audience, join the Patreon, subscribe. Uh, I think there's a couple in the audience that probably aren't subscribed. So yeah, well, look <laughs> at us a little bit of money. <laughs> Looking at you guys. There is one that is though. Yeah. So, yeah. so obviously behind the curtain, we've just wrapped up day number two of the Oceania League. So we've all kind of just come back to the studio for this particular episode. It's been uh, a, a fun, fun week, fun couple of days, especially back in the studio. Um, but obviously now we get down to the real business, which is the Jake and Guy show. Yeah, look, it's been a, a long couple of days um, and we'll be completely transparent. We actually recorded an episode before we worked and it was trash. So now we're re-recording it at like 12.30 in the morning. But that's, that's okay. the kind of commitment you can expect from us. Exactly. That's yeah. what you can expect uh, on this particular show. So uh, let's get into sort of today's agenda. Now we've kind of got a general segment and then we've kind of got an esports e segment. We'll start with the general segment, which is the rise of content creators playing Rainbow Six siege and uh, i think that's probably been the case now over the last week to two weeks i think for the most part now i think a lot of this is probably a flow-on effect from jinxie what he's been able to do the notoriety that he has gained has probably seen others go hey why don't we go and try a hand at rainbow yeah there's been a big influx uh dr disrespect tim the tap man um nick Merckx, i think nick as Merckx, well yeah, yeah the, the whole bunch of the that crew have been jumping on amongst others and look it hasn't just been a one and done They've all done multiple streams, you know, five, six hours plus the sentiment amongst them and you know, from the, the clips and stuff that I've seen and the content they're pushing out and, and the comment sections, et cetera, has actually been, you know, quite positive. And the other asterisk on it is that as far as I am aware and, you know, 99% confident it's the truth that these are not being paid activations. They're mm. not like a hashtag classic ad or whatever. Ubisoft isn't. Yeah shilling out for them to be playing the game and saying nice things about it they're genuinely interested they're giving it a crack they're sticking with it and i think that's obviously very positive for the game and the community it's also positive for ubisoft because they don't have to spend any money <laughs> that's always good there's a lot of other game titles that would be spending a lot of money to get these kind of content creators playing their game so they get it for free free advertising and i i hope that in some ways it has a solid flow and effect obviously to the game itself as we've spoken about in one of our recent episodes the, the health of the game has been pretty good. The Steam chart numbers are showing positive growth. A lot of that can be attributed to many things. Obviously, seasonal launch, Jinxie has been a big factor. These new content creators getting on board. So it's kind of this snowball that's taking shape. Mm. And hopefully it just doesn't crash and burn and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. That's really the goal of it. So, And then the next part of that then would be, can that translate to, say, esports, for example? Does that bring viewers to the esports program? These people that obviously are watching the content creators might then play the game, like the game, then start to watch the game competitively. That's probably not something we would see much of now because that's more of a future thing. The, uh, the effects of seeing these people play the game and then their viewers playing the game themselves to then translate that to esports watching, that, that's something that's going to be more down the road. Yeah, and I guess the next natural evolution, especially if Ubisoft are genuinely wanting to back them in, would be to get them co-streaming or get them out to these events in person. You know, we see that a lot in Valorant, for instance, where, you know, like Champions, for example, they have like dedicated booths yep. where content creators, streamers, personalities actually co-stream the, the events live in person. Now, obviously these streamers make a lot of money. If you're pulling them away from their primary source of income. You're going to have to supplement that. They're going to, you know, require you to, to pay up big for yeah. that kind of uh, marketing. So you have to try and make that trade and, and that, that balance is it actually worth it. Um, because at the moment, Ubisoft can kind of just ride this wave. Yeah. They're getting all this free marketing and exposure. Um, but maybe, you know, Atlanta possibly, maybe, but probably looking, at the, likes soon, of, probably looking at the likes of SI, I yeah. would imagine. I feel like Atlanta is probably too soon because it has been a, a bit of a recency thing in terms of the uptick in content creation. Uh, and I doubt Ubisoft is probably going to go and get maybe like an older school Siege content creator. They would like to probably get the new age ones, the ones that are coming in already have big followings elsewhere. And I, I think it's a little bit too new for that. As you said, maybe something like a six invitational, that would be something I would aim for. The thing is they also have to pay out of pocket for that. Like you're not just going to go and get yeah. Dr. Disrespect to come for free. <laughs> no. You got to think about how much money these content creators actually make uh, across the board throughout the amount of time that they're, they're spending live 
if you have to get them to come over for a six invitation, regardless of how long they're there for, that's still travel days. That's still actually there on the, the days itself. That's a, a lot of content creation days that they will be missing out on. That's a lot of money that they'll be missing out on. That's a lot of money out of Ubisoft's pocket. So they have to also kind of look at that. Is it then worth it? I think in some ways it could be because you're kind of capitalizing on a new trend. And I, and I think that's always a good thing to do. So uh, again, I think it landed probably too soon for that, maybe an SI in the future. But hey, look, more content creators that keep getting onto Siege, that's better for the game overall, the health of the game. And eventually, as I said before, that will translate to, to the esports program with time, probably not right away. Moving on to the next topic though, and away from content creation and more to the game itself, but in mobile form. Yeah. We love mobile games um, <laughs> and we love mobile esports. Yeah, get on it, Ubisoft. But no, uh, R6 Mobile recently soft launched in a couple of territories, namely Canada and Mexico. Um, I believe it's on iOS. I'm not going to pretend to know the ins and outs of the mobile game yep. as PC is my haven, but it sounds like the game is doing okay. Um, unfortunately, it looks like maybe their decision to release it in the way it has has backfired a little bit. The community sentiment in some of those posts that I saw you know, but generally a lot of people are complaining, why can't I play it yet? Why isn't it available yeah. in my region? But to be fair, and to play devil's advocate for Ubisoft, and of all the places I saw it, I think it was like LinkedIn. I saw the CEO of Ubisoft come out and say that this is pretty much like their first proper go at a AAA mobile game. So I assume the way in which they're releasing it is to try and be better safe than sorry. You don't want to be dropping it in the, you know, the hugely popular regions like, Know, your Indias and your Chinas, etc. Yep. And South you East absolutely Asia. stuff it up because you're probably going to find it very hard to build that reputation back up. Yeah, it makes sense. I think you're going to probably want to maybe steer clear from what would be your bigger segment straight away. You want to probably go and test the waters and, and a, what better place to do that than say a Canada or a Mexico. That they're not going to be your prime movers in terms of the product once it's launched. So you can kind of just go test the water, see what needs to be fixed from there. Uh, and then eventually, obviously, they will want to be targeting India and Southeast yep. Asia and China quite extensively. That will be their big markets. That's where they'll actually want to launch the game probably first. Like when the game is actually launched, launched, it'll, it'll 100% hit those markets straight away. Um, the thing for me is what's going to be the flow on effect in terms of the PC version as well. Do you see an uptick in people watching the esports program or even just Twitch in general? Or do they find that maybe they get introduced to the game via mobile, then eventually go to PC? Yeah. Is there going to even be a correlation? I haven't really probably looked into the actual mobile to PC pathway numbers and with the, if that's even a thing because at the end of the day in a lot of these regions they don't have access to computers in the way that the western world does so yep. for them mobile is it that's all they've got so this is a, an untapped market for ubisoft in terms of their own product for, for rainbow six siege and it could be a lot of money so maybe maybe it's on a player flow and effect but it could actually end up being a money flow and effect that the money generated from rainbow six mobile could then actually go towards the pc game as well yeah, potentially, or it could be completely segmented and they don't really cross pollinate at all. It could be like completely separate. I don't know. I wonder what the effect of like PUBG Mobile has been on PUBG. I, I, would, I, think I, I would argue that it kind of didn't really positively impact the PC game much at all, did it? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was I guess, somewhat separated. And um, I, I will say there was probably a belief within PUBG that for a long time, PUBG Mobile was actually propping up PUBG PC. Right. Um, now with PUBG PC you know, largely coming to an end, the, the way that its esports program looks, the game is obviously just not really doing all that particularly well. PUBG Mobile probably is now seeing its revenue stay within PUBG Mobile, I would imagine, right? So, uh, and I also think it's a completely different thing because PUBG itself is just largely strong in the eastern countries anyway it's not that strong in the western country uh, country so i i think that it's probably a little bit of a, a different game to, to probably highlight in a comparison point of view i kind of understand what you you mean i think this is more like the flip effect despite the fact that PUBG started out on pc once mobile came out that just completely blew the numbers out of the roof i don't see that happening with rainbow six mobile i think rainbow six itself on pc is strong enough still in the western countries that i don't think mobile would necessarily just overtake it yeah um, I don't really have much more. To add. <laughs> I think we've. Uh, you're not a. Uh, you're not a mobile out. connoisseur, Gus. If there's less walls on mobile, you know what? I might fucking be. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting a bit sick of the walls at the moment. Um, moving on. Yep. Uh, I believe the next point is the signature skins, right? So Ubisoft released a bit of a teaser tweet. Um, before uh, then going on to the 
actually launched the skin and you know is alluding to signatures with like a, a side eye emoji and there are a lot of people like the conspiracy theorists are, were out in arms thinking that maybe we'd get like player signatures yeah. and all kinds of crazy shit and it turned out to be a pretty boring generic bow, black bow, and bow. white logo universal skin universal skin is great i don't really like the idea of being locked into one particular gun if i want to support my favorite team or whatever so that mm -hmm. was nice unfortunately though the design was a little bit uninspired and it cost a thousand credits, which is a little bit pricey in my opinion. Um, but I don't want to harp on the negatives all too much for this discussion. I saw I saw the community reaction and thought, okay, it looks like people agree with, you know, at least me, I don't know about you. Signature items in the game, however you want to format it, however you want to release it, is a really great idea to support players, to support orgs. Imagine there was like a set for the SI winners or every yeah, SI player got their signature in the game. If we had stickers in the game, for example, you know, following the CS route Charms. or now that we have player backgrounds or charms however you want to format it i think having signatures having players or content creators or whoever else in the game is another really exciting revenue stream for ubisoft but also i think players would enjoy it as well yeah i think it's a win-win situation when you kind of put it into into that sort of facet like you're looking at sort of just continuing to put focus really on the players themselves which is i, I think something that esports in general probably lacks is the sort of play of yep. focus. I think maybe CS probably does it just about the, maybe the best. And um, when you think about sort of esports in general, a lot of the time it's that team focus, right? It's team sets, it's team skins, it's team charms, it's team background, but there's no real play of focus. And I think this is something where like, yes, yeah, signatures in the sense of not necessarily player signature, but signature skins of say players and their own creative designs, maybe with a, either with a team element or without the team element, regardless, I think is something that they can definitely look into. And obviously the best way to probably bring that into the fold straight away would be say a team wins the major, all of all the five players kind of like have their hand in, in creating a skin of some kind that represents themselves winning the major or something along those lines. And to not make it generic, like please, like the, there's enough generic skins, there's enough generic yep. charms, there's enough gener generic backgrounds. And I understand when you bring in a system, like when the backgrounds first came in, if you look at all the original um, portraits, like they're all just super shit, yeah. super shit, sh super generic. And that's okay because in some ways you're, you're just starting out the system. And only just now we're starting to see some teams actually create some really nice portrait backgrounds. But I, I would like to see Ubisoft definitely take this signature skin uh, motto and, and really expand on it throughout majors, throughout SI and, and really get the most out of it. Obviously it works for them and then it would work for the players and therefore the teams as well. Yeah, give us actual signatures or some kind yeah. of proper like, go, player collaboration. With it. Like, like at this point, like, you know, I'm not even saying necessarily, we spoke about this in one of our first episodes regarding like the the, the marketplace and like, do you get stickers? Do you, yep. you know bring those kind of things into Siege? How would that even look? Like, I don't know how it would look, but I, I don't see why you can't just even in some way have like a universal sticker slot that you then say a team wins the major and either you have a team a sticker or the five players and they get sort of stickers. They create them themselves. And then that way they don't have to go and create an actual gun skin. That also means that people who like their own gun skins that they've got but want to like pay, tri pay tribute to a team or a player can then apply that to the sticker slot on the gun. I think that's certain ways you can look into adding that. So hopefully Ubisoft is listening and they can take our ideas for free. Well, I don't know about three. We, we accept royalties. Or they could subscribe to our Patreon. <laughs> they could. They could do that. <laughs> uh, moving forward now to the esports segment where we've probably got uh, far more understanding, I hope. Well, yeah. Some of us. Namely me. Yeah. It, you are the analyst. Um, okay. So obviously it's been a solid week back for all the regions now. They've concluded their first week um, throughout the esports program and we've seen some interesting results pretty much across almost all regions some regions have played out the way we expected i think maybe eul being one of them uh, others definitely have not played out as expected maybe nal being one of them we'll start with eul first and we'll get up our grading system which we said at the end of our last episode <laughs> we would um, bring into the fold now this is a combined grading system this is you and i and the way we sort of have viewed the first week and the teams themselves and where they're at it is a power rankings it's not just necessarily based on the standings themselves obviously some some leagues actually just have groups. They don't even have the standing. So yeah. it's a little bit difficult. Uh, for EUI, we've got the Wolves in the S tier, Koi down in the F tier, and the rest making up A, B to C. Um, I think the, the most notable one there is maybe VP down in C. Uh, oh, 
I guess. I think I put VP maybe a little bit higher than they deserved in the predictions. I'm trying to remember. Um, I'll flush it up in the edit and make myself look silly <laughs> if that was the case. Um, so yeah, unfortunate there for VP. Um, I guess the big storyline, at least for us being from Oris, was Koi and their very disappointing entrance into the league. Zero seven 7 against Wild to kick things off. And then they had that 6-8 uh, banger on mm. Clubhouse against Secret, unable to kind of just get across that final hurdle. Jigsaw, he did okay. He was relatively impactful in that second match. But yeah, for Koi overall, that roster not quite clicking early on in this group stage. I guess maybe, yeah, besides VP and, and on a more positive light, the big story was the Wolves in their two massive wins, 7-4 over Eminem and also 7-4 over G2. I mean, basically a perfect start to the stage for them. Um, they actually play, as of this recording, in about the next two hours where they'll take on Heroic. I imagine they'll be heavy favorites. I imagine they should be able to get the win there. Heroic are in the dumps at the moment. That's maybe another... Yeah. story for another time i've seen a lot of stuff on twitter about uh the the state of heroic at the moment and honestly maybe they were probably worthy of f tier in uh, well if they hadn't have pushed g2 they probably would have yeah they pushed g2 a little bit to ot so that's obviously a noteworthy performance but yeah overall heroic not in the in the best of shape no certainly not all right moving on to our next league which i imagine will be nal and we'll we'll flash up the list here and I don't even need to see it on our end because I already know <laughs> on the list that's up at the moment, it's wildcard in the S tier. What a start. <laughs> Living up to their name, they come in as a wildcard kind of team and they just completely shake up this, the scene immediately. Massive wins over, uh, well, I got the massive win, I guess, over Sonics. And then from there, respectable wins where they won comfortably in terms of round differential yeah. against uh, the others. Uh, and obviously, Sonics, not only after then losing to Wildcard, then lost another one to Luminosity too. So we've got them completely in the F tier. And I think when we kind of go back to our original power rankings for making the major, it's largely kind of what we've got, but you would have swapped Wildcard and Sonics <laughs> completely around in terms of the S and the F tier. So that has just put the NAL on its head. Yeah, I mean, quite literally, wait, what an insane start to the league and Sonics just being a little bit slow out of the blocks and it can prove costly in, in this kind of format. So we'll see how they go about bouncing back. That's probably going to be the exciting storyline for them if they're able to make a run home. Uh, the next team to probably I want to talk about, M80, mm. because I was red hot on them Yeah, for the major spot. I was you cool. were, yeah, you weren't quite as hot. Um, they obviously had an okay start, you know, 7-2, DZ. Massive start. We'll take then... that. But then they kind of dropped the ball a little bit. OXG, 5-7. Very close result. OXG, very respectable opponent. So you, I don't want to be, you know, dismissing OXG's efforts in that game. But I would have seen M80 as the team to pretty swiftly kind of push that sort of opponent over. So, yeah, yeah they get a B rating, but M80... Well, it's really in the mix. It's not like it's doom and gloom or anything Yeah, like before that. we get to the next region, though, in hindsight, looking at this, I, I do wonder if maybe we went a little high on, on Dark Zero, considering it was a pretty comfortable loss to M80. I think there's a world in which you could have said, instead of A, maybe B, to basically join them. When you kind of summarize and, and, and sort of finalize uh, NAL for week one, wildcard, amazing, uh, oxygen, pretty good start. Everyone else definitely made a stumble at some point within the first couple of play days for NAR, which is always good for a league, I guess, from a viewership perspective. Um, but for North America itself, obviously some question marks there about uh, how dominant some of those teams can actually end up being. Moving on to the next league though, uh, we've got Brazil, which also, again, this is becoming a bit of a common theme, but there has been some shakeups along the way. Certain teams that have dropped the bundle a little bit. Liquid down into the C tier, guys. Oh, yeah, that's a little bit harsh. But look, I think rightly justified, they find themselves in fourth in the standings, so they're in that red danger zone off the back of a 2-7 loss mm. to E1. Hence, we've bumped them all the way up to S tier because you can't 7-2 Liquid, one of the scariest teams in the world, and without it's the game they played. being respected. Yeah. And um, and then going on to 8-6 OT win against Keed, which again, obviously a win. They bounce back after you know a disappointing day one. So the next day they come out of the gates, they're able to get two points. But Overall, compared to you know where we expect Liquid to be in a top-heavy league, they didn't live up to that expectation. And then working our way down, Nip, Phase, W7M, the big three other orgs slash teams in the region, they find themselves in the A tier. Um, not not particularly bad starts, not particularly amazing starts. Yeah. But I mean, Nip, 
number one, phase two, and then obviously the win for W7M in Group B. Yeah, I mean, big win over Loss. Uh, Loss won seven nothing, so an absolute beatdown. That was the only game we saw from Loss as well. So they're in the F tier because of that. Uh, the fact that they lost to a team that I think, when I go back to my Atlanta power rankings in terms of whether or not they can make the major, I'm pretty sure I had them almost roughly the same level as NIP. For NIP to then seven o them. And that's the only game we've seen from Lost. That's F tier in my mind. So again, a little bit of a shake up to sort of begin. And, you know, somewhat to reiterate in a way, it's play it's play day one too, you know, it's it's week one for a lot of these regions. You can give them some leeway. But that comes down to the league itself. There are certain leagues where you don't get much of a leeway, and there's others where you do. And this region coming up here, in some ways, doesn't have too much of a leeway. Uh in some fashion as we bring yeah. it up it is japan uh and straight away i want to go straight to f tier now firstly <laughs> f for fanatic oh but they're not in the f tier because we had expectations for them it's just the matter and how they lost minus 13 round differential from three games it's it's quite bad and the other one is varil massive to see them out of the group stage considering um what we expected is, is a varil or a vega it is a that right. Varel, sorry, I don't know why I had La Vega. We'll get to them later, actually, it's, from it's, Korea. But it's 1 a.m., you're, you're forgiven. It's somewhat similar, I think, actually, though, between the two of them, because Varel is a team that I thought would not come in leaps and bounds into this stage, but maybe see improvement. And yet now they find themselves completely out of the knockout stage. They have to go through last chance qualifiers. Yeah. Um, and they also had a minus 10 round differential. The only thing I'll say is, in fairness, Exist, Fav, Northampton. No, actually, there is nothing. They probably should have got something from that. And to yep. to lose all their games, to have that kind of round differential for a team like Varel, yeah, it's quite disappointing. Yeah, definitely a backpedal, considering that they were very promising coming out of stage one. And the expectation was for them to, yeah. you know, maybe not walk out the best in the in Japan or anything to that extent, but to be highly competitive. They didn't deliver that. Looking our way up the standings, the next team to probably discuss is Scars. They find themselves at a B yeah. rating, which is okay. You know, second in their group, they had a relatively tough one, at least historically, which Cyclops ended up topping out. That's why they're in the A tier. But Cyclops stage one, they weren't particularly strong. Scars, in fact, probably had their number. Not the case here in stage number two. And then, of course, above them, head and shoulders, really above the rest of the competition, the only team that had a perfect run, North Epson. So they're going to yeah. be really dangerous in that knockout bracket. And we'll pop that up on screen. And honestly, I mean, Scars might be able to do some damage onto North Epson. It could go down to a third map if that ends up eventuating. Um, Cyclops, arguably, I for think, my liking, probably have the easier run. <laughs> I think Cyclops is in an absolute box seat position to go to the major from here. So Exist and Crest to battle it out in the quarterfinal. The winner of that plays Cyclops in a best of three. Uh, Cyclops, in my mind, would have to pull a Cyclops to miss the major from well, here. I mean, seriously. That could happen. <laughs> the other side of the of the, the knockout stage, Scars versus North Epson, what a semifinal that would end up being. Um, and I think, obviously, those three in particular, once again, as they were, um, well, not I guess, probably not Cyclops. Cyclops, typically over the his history in Japan, considered always one of the better teams. I think that they'll go to Atlanta along with North Epson and Scars. For me, it's just a matter of, one or two of, oh, sorry, one of North Epson and Scars have to obviously do it in a different pathway. One of them has to miss out from the knockout stage. So uh, it'll be very curious to see uh, how that sort of unfolds. I would say to very much uh, tune into the Japanese broadcast to, to see how that all plays out because it's going to be a fun finish. And of course, then the grand final determines who goes straight to phase two. Yep. On to Korea, uh, the kind of sister region, I guess. And now I can actually talk about La Vega because they're in the F tier. They've bombed out <laughs> the group stage uh, and they've disappointed me greatly. A terrible, terrible run. Despite the start, the first match, they go and beat D plus Kia and then it's loss, loss and they're out of the groups. I mean, seriously, La Vega, that is absolutely <laughs> awful. How have you stuffed that up? Yeah, and um, for those who may not know, this is one of the regions we have covered. I think we're, we're done now, but... We did cast the first little bit here of the South Korea League and there was a running joke between us two where, you know, you're pumping up La Vega. What did you say? Top four team? Oh, yeah, I or said, top two team? Or... I said top four yeah. coming into it. Yep. Um, coming into the stage itself in terms of the, the pre-stage discussion. And uh, and as soon as they then got the win over D-plus here, I was like, that's it, top two. These guys are going <laughs> to the major again. And of course, for those unaware, they did go to, to Copenhagen. They did it the long way though, right? So they did actually lose their fifth place matchup back in stage one, which actually forced them to drop down to the open quals from open quals. They won that. They then won last chance. They went to the major. They're going to have to do that again. Yeah. I mean, that it, it, does lightning strike twice? I'm not too sure. 
They're a good team on their day, but they, yeah, they they dropped some bad games. Uh, unfortunately for Blossom, despite some pickups, um, once again, kind of rough stage. In terms of the, the top end, though, S yes, stands for Sandbox, and they were yep. absolutely perfect. Nova, of course, has, has filled in for Envy Taylor from what we've heard. The, the rumor is Envy Taylor has a hand injury of some kind. Uh, I'm not sure of the validity of it or the extent of it or anything, but Nova's been really good. Yeah, and Sandbox have been really solid, and that's why we've put them in that S-tier position. Didn't have that flawless run, or the team that didn't have that flawless run, of course, being D+. Plus, that's why they got knocked down a tier. But also in that A-tier, Talon Weeble, two teams, I guess maybe less expectation on Weeble, but they both surpassed the expectations yep. that we outlined for them. Weeble actually coming out of the gates really strong. And I kind of see a world in the knockout bracket where if Weeble can connect the dots and catch D plus on a bad day, provided they take Talon down, I don't know. They could be cooking something up. They certainly could be. We'll put the knockout stage bracket uh, on the screen here. And I think the lower side, Sandbox, have got a bit of a free ride. Somewhat similar to probably CAG in, yeah. in Japan. Um BSG before and after. BSG, obviously, we've seen in the region for quite some time. They looked a little bit shaky in the group stage before and after. Nice new team that is, has a great start. They get to uh, you know try themselves out in the quarterfinals. But yeah, I think Sandbox will have a free run. Talon and Weeble, though, that is the, the one to watch in the quarterfinal. That should be a really fascinating matchup. The winner of that then gets to take on D-plus here. And I think from that point... Uh, yeah, as you said, there is sort of that dark horse. I don't think D plus Kia are as infallible as Sandbox. I think that they're somewhat susceptible. I can't wait to sort of see how that plays out. So but for both Korea and Japan, the knockout stage has some interesting matchups. And, uh, and for both of them, probably one team should be getting a free ride in CAG and Sandbox. Uh, On to the next region, though. It is the Asia League. Now, this is combining both Southeast Asia and South Asia. And the way we're ranking it is pretty much as the leagues combined. Like, we're not just necessarily ranking South Asia separately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and as you can kind of see here, Bleed, Fury, absolutely on top. Both 4-0, both massive round differential, basically farming Southeast Asia. Die Wolves not too far behind them. Um, and then we've given a little bit of a token of appreciation from South Asia <laughs> for us. <laughs> what? That's an interesting... A token of appreciation? Jeez. God, we're charity. I don't know about that. Um, I'll, I'll just piggyback off your point because I know pretty much exactly what you're going to say. Give a shout out to um, our brothers over in South Asia. His Sib Warriors, renowned. Throwing them in the B tier. Now, clearly quite strong in, in South Asia from what we've seen. However, this is combined. If we had a, if we throw them in to the Lions Den, like, you know, a Bleeder or a Fury, I don't think they're going to come out the other side in one piece. But yeah, shout out to them. I guess the next big notable team to then talk about going down the line is going to be No Cap in mm -hmm. that C tier. I had mixed emotions, mixed expectations for them heading into the stage. I thought, who knows, maybe this team could kind of just come out of nowhere, do like a Kelton's Knights from O's and just like stun the league. Unfortunately, they were the ones that got stun locked and they didn't really get much done in the first week. No, they certainly didn't. And uh, obviously, Elevate in the F tier as well is um, quite startling for them. Zero and three start, minus 14 round differential. It's a shocking start for them in fairness the only thing i could say is they've played i think arguably the three best teams to begin with so yeah. i'm sure they'll pick up points over in week two and and sort of start to shoot back up the standings but they're not making top three and that means they'll, they'll eventually have to go through open quals to get into last chance quals and, and all of that so uh, a bit of a longer path for alibi i imagine i think the same then obviously for no cap and the rest of that f tier is mainly due to the fact that a lot of those teams have been largely uh uncompetitive or for some even in south asia just straight up not even showing up so, oh, don't even, <laughs> oh, don't even start. I mean, we work the South Asia broadcast and, you know, we get it. We're understanding the infrastructure sometimes can be really, really frustrating for the players to deal with. It's, you know, often out of their hands, but yeah, delays, substitutes, forfeits. Power I outages mean, just, after every round. Yeah, whatever you can think of, <laughs> it's happened in that league already in the first week or whatever. It's so, been a lot of fun. That's it's been sure. rough. Those teams are also playing like, overall, the, the, the game is trending towards, you know, the TDM meta. Mm-hmm. South Asia is like on a whole nother level of just pure chaos and randomness. So, yeah. Fortunately, though, a league that has come on leaps and bounds to begin week one. And it's our very own Oceania League. Best and in the world. Honestly, at the moment, it's been some really good quality siege. And we're not just saying that considering we weren't necessarily in high praise to begin when we kind of began the show uh, for play day one. We were... Uh, a little bit sour. We probably anticipated that this stage was going to play largely similar to stage one. 
And boy, were we wrong in across a good way. the board in a good way. The level of siege that we've seen, and you can see obviously on the tier list, we've got no one in the F tier. <laughs> At the back end, of, now I will well, say, yeah, yeah. I will say, <laughs> there's, a, there's an asterisk on the asterisk. There is an asterisk here. We may have had Bliss in the F tier. They've somewhat redeemed themselves ever so slightly <laughs> on Play Day 2. But uh, clearly, regardless if they're in the C or in the F, a, a bit of a rough start for them for a team that we had absolutely making the major. In a league that you can make no mistakes, they've made mistakes. Yeah, well... Maybe you can make mistakes with how closely compact it's been. And that's the storyline going forward now. Can Triple R, can Rapid Response Regiment, God, I hate that name. Um, can they seat themselves in the S tier and can they stay there? And we're going to get an answer to that next week. Mm. Um, so that power rank is going to be very, very interesting. Triple R taking on Bliss. The winner of that pretty much in the box seat for the major um, because of how that how head-to-head -head works, etc. So Bliss have kind of scathed away with how they've been able to get through so far with three points. Had they have lost again today in OT, and that almost was actually the case, then it would be a very much, a very, very grim discussion for them. But they've kept their head above water. And looking at the rest of the league, I mean, there have been some standout performances, the likes of Carlton's Knights, the washed up stack of guys who haven't really touched the game, they had to dust it off in order to load into the server for this competition, the takedown bliss, and to have, you know, a respectable performance yeah. tonight as well. Shout out to them. They've, you know, done their job already for entertaining us. They obviously did end up losing to Circular Spheres, all by in a close one. They even had regulation match point in mm. that final game to, to collect all three points. Had they done that, boy, we really would have had to take notice of them. Still, like, they're pretty high in the power rankings for CS, just able to hold on to that A spot. They are second in the league, four points, just the two behind Triple R. Their matchup actually with Triple R is the very last game in the very last play day. So if we do have to wait... Could be a major match. To find out whoever wins that matchup goes to the major, it's the last game. So that's yeah. at least... They've done a, they did a really good job on the schedule if they had the, the <laughs> we, foresight for that. Well, look, we may have complained a little bit about the schedule initially because all <laughs> Bliss are actually playing all their top matches in the first two weeks, which yeah. as, as you mentioned, they play Triple R next week and we were a little bit worried that they were going to end up yeah, maybe winning all of those games and then the last three weeks were going to be quite uh, not as fun. But that fortunately is no longer the case and, and fortunately the region itself has, um, as I said, improved dramatically. And we're talking not just gunplay but also team play, team synergy uh, has been, I think, far and away improved from what we saw in stage one, which, you know, again, stage one in itself for Oceania probably was the weakest we'd seen in the region for quite some time. Yep. And speaking to a lot of the players in the player interviews, they feel like there's been massive improvements here for stage two. Not necessarily saying it's the strongest it's ever been, but absolutely in a much better healthy state. It's been a lot of fun. It's been very entertaining, good games, and I think good storylines that are, that are developing. So obviously we're a little bit biased. We're always going to be homerism on it, but um, I, I would definitely say if you're watching and you haven't tuned in much to the Oceania League. We played eight games, five of which were overtimes, um, all really tense, close finishes in a league that are all best of ones, not ideal for the players, but great for the broadcast. So I would highly suggest tune in, watch the VODs um, for Oceania. Yeah, and I mean, just opening, I guess it's more of a global discussion, opening it up a little bit. We know that it applies to OS specifically, but why is it so close? Why is it so competitive? And that's kind of something we've been picking out a little bit on on the desk and on the broadcast, I am under the impression that a lot of it has to do with, obviously there's a lot of great new up and coming teams, players, whatever, that have worked really hard to get in the position they're at. But yeah. I think it's also a combination of where we're at in terms of the game and the meta and the map pool. Um, I mean, we even saw like Nighthaven tonight. We've been seeing some, you know, a variation in bands to what we saw in stage one and just overall teams and players that are super sharp are, are now really shining in a competitive sense that's always been in the, the case in siege you know you've always had your really strong mechanic players you had like canto back in the day you had your bowlers you've still got your sports etc but it now feels like that that second line of attack is even more impactful than it's ever been it's less about utility utility is still important don't get me wrong composition strategy it still has its time and its place but oh specifically we've seen how much yeah. more competitive and tightly contested these rounds have been how many overtimes we've had and a lot of it is coming down to, you know, just pure mechanics and, and the, the fights around the map and stuff, whereas it may not have been like that in the past. Somewhat leads into our next and, and sort of final segment, but the, the changes in terms of 
uh, operators, map changes explicitly as well. You mentioned Nighthaven Labs. We've seen it twice now, actually. And I must say, Nighthaven Labs is actually playing pretty nicely in terms of yeah. um, the competitive map pool. I think it's been a really good addition. It's kind of TDM while you still have a focus on utility. I think it allows uh, the players to have good gunfights throughout the map, both inside and outside the map. It pretty much offers just about everything. So I would definitely say Nighthaven Labs has been a large success so far since uh, it's been introduced into the competitive map pool. Yeah, um, I, I largely agree. I guess Consulate then, which we unfortunately casted a little bit, has been probably not as nice of a addition in my opinion just yet i think especially watching teams attack it it's very <laughs> it's very tedious at the moment i think we need to see the attack find more ways to unlock different positions just because of the nature of the map and the multitude of rooms and angles that have now been created attack needs to find a probably a more efficient way to yep. deal with those once they do it'll be great um and in terms of operators right obviously ram has seen a decent amount of play um we've seen the the Grim rework. Mate, Grim's in uh, the has meta. has been a hot discussion. If you got banned out, I think, in the South <laughs> Asia game. It did. Uh, Fenrir has been incredibly potent. Yep. has had a very high presence, whether it be banned or picked. So everything's had its place, but nothing has been super overbearing. Nothing's like a 90% plus mm -hmm. presence that I can think of, right? It's not like Rams a must pick or a must ban, nor is Fenrir. I'd say Azami still has issues, but that's longstanding and it's been addressed by the devs. So hopefully that gets fixed next year. But just overall, the, the state of the game, I think, is great. And the map pool's okay. Again, yep. I'm not a huge fan of nine maps, but discussion for another day. But overall, and it seems like, you know, the players are enjoying it. We're having fun casting it. So, yeah. yeah. I, would, I would actually say right now, the state of Rainbow Six Siege is arguably in the best position it's been in in terms of competitiveness at the eSport level, uh, at a viewership level. That, that's the, probably my, my thought. I, I think when you kind of think back to some of the earlier days, there was a heavy emphasis on utility meta. There's the 22nd meta. Uh, so if you kind of look at it historically, it's always been more focused on the utility. And may, maybe there's nothing wrong with it being a little bit more sort of, you know, gun focused and sort of the, the actual raw skill of the mechanics being now the, the ever focus. We don't have to see players be so overly reliant on particular operators, which is leading to more picks. I mean, at the end of the day, if I'm seeing a Grim get banned, then anything is up to be, to be banned at this <laughs> yeah, point. Yeah. So, um, no, I think it's been I think it's been really, really good. And I think the game is trending in a good direction. That's the main thing for me. So, um, very happy with that, um, both for operators and for the maps. Coming to a close, though, for episode six, um, I will add we've got, obviously, uh, a little bit of Patreon-exclusive content to Ooh, film. Um, that's going to be actually surrounding some drama. Um, a little bit local drama, I will say, between uh, Elevate and Turdster Ooh. of all people. So a little bit, uh, a little bit local in terms of some some good old Twitter. I can I can see one of our patrons in the crowd. He's uh his head has risen from his phone. He's very interested. He's, He's going to get his money's worth. Yeah. He's definitely going to get his money's <laughs> worth while he uh, plays some chess. Um, <laughs> but no, obviously, a big shout out to everyone for watching once again, especially if you've made it this far. It means a lot. If yep. you subscribe on Patreon, you'll get to see some of the um, exclusive drama shenanigans is going to be coming your way along with the fact that you get to contact us on discord you can have some questions uh you can obviously provide potential questions that get answered on the podcast or even just privately uh, if you want to get in contact with us that's the best way to do it of course uh, if you would like to even still post some suggestions comments on the youtube comments feel free we do take from there we do look from there along with all of the socials uh, across the board but uh, that is us done for episode six of the siege show it's jake and guys signing out ready to hit the hay we are tired it's been a <laughs> long week and we will see you next week Bye. Mwah.